Welcome back to another episode of the Charged Up Show. In this episode, we talk to our first professional athlete, Zach Dalpy. He's had an amazing career so far where he started playing hockey locally in Ontario, then committing to the Ohio State University and going on to sign with multiple NHL teams such as the Carolina Hurricanes, Vancouver Canucks, Minnesota Wild, Columbus Blue Jackets, and the Buffalo Sabres. Without giving too much away, hope you enjoy this episode. Please welcome to the podcast our first ever professional hockey player from Paris, Ontario, Zach Dalby. So, Zach, what's going on right now in COVID? What are you doing? Uh, just, yeah, just trying to raise two kids. Um, I got a three-year-old and a, and a 10-month-old. They're, they're nuts, just like I was as a kid. So, uh, I'm getting payback now and um, starting to skate this week, which is interesting. Rinks are starting to open up. I don't know if you guys knew that, but I'm in Hamilton this week skating, um, which I was unaware of that rinks were going to start opening up. But uh, So, that's obviously huge for being a hockey player and a guy that had knee surgery four months ago that wants to get back on the ice. So just trying to uh, somehow become a better hockey player through all this madness. Yeah, for sure. How was your uh, kind of rehab with that? Do you think that skating kind of like, was that a, a, like a good jump for you or? Um... Yeah. Well, I haven't been on, so I haven't skated since November of last year. Oh, okay. um, I, I had season ending knee surgery in January. Um, I heard it in November and then I, tried to rehab it without surgery. It didn't get any better. So um, I think on Saturday, I'm skating. It'll be the first time since November 24th of 2019, which is insane to think. Wow. But yeah, I've been rehabbing. Um, obviously, not having hands-on therapy with a specialist kind of hurts your, uh, I guess, your trajectory of where you're going to go as far as when you should be back on the ice. But um, built the gym in the basement and uh been facetiming and zoom like we're doing now with a with a personal th- uh, therapist and then a trainer as well to to try to somehow get stronger so it's a bit different but i don't mind it i don't have to get in the car and go anywhere and i think my wife that, that likes having me home a bit more too yeah how, how have you found the train uh the training like at the start of covid um obviously i'm not training to the extent you are but um still going like five days a week and i i a couple weeks in i i kind of couldn't do it anymore like just being by myself in your basement or whatever. And then once we got that group going, like I said, Walker, which we'll talk about later is in the group and we zoom every day. It's way better because there's other guys. And even though they're not with you, it's on the zoom and for you as a trainer, but how did you find that? Yeah. I mean, I think I'm at a different point in my life where, uh, with you guys, it's nice to be around the boys and, uh, you know, have that camaraderie. But for me, especially during this lockdown, having a two hours to yourself without any screaming kids, I try to take advantage of it. So I actually really look forward to uh, getting into the gym and, and banging out a workout. So yeah, it's different. Like I said, where I'm at a different point in my life where uh, I enjoy two hours to myself as opposed to with, with other guys. So yeah. that would be a uh, kind of a weird answer, but that's just the way that I am right now for sure. Fair enough. Yeah. I find it tough being a parent through all of this. Um, not, I mean, you get to spend more time with your kids. I hear people like explaining or complaining that, the like their kids are driving them crazy. Like, yeah, they are, I mean, but they're kids. So mm-hmm. they, they don't know they're driving you crazy. So, um, no, I, I've actually, that's a good question, but, um, I've actually really enjoyed it. Obviously some days are long. And like I said, you look forward to those two hours where you're, where they're with, where they're napping and you get to have time to yourself. But uh, I've actually really, really enjoyed it because um, before if I was to be left alone with two kids without my wife here, I'd probably be panicking a little bit. But now since I'm around them as much, so much that uh, I know the routines and I don't travel and I'm not on the road. So my wife can, you know, when this is all said and done and the world returns back to some type of normalcy, I'll be able to uh, let her get out of the house a bit more and I won't panic with two kids. As you guys will find out, it's, it's harder than it. It looks for sure. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's time to jump right into it. Nate's Nate got super excited when he found out he went to Ohio State. It's his, it's yeah, his dream I'm school. I'm a huge uh, Buckeye fan. So why is that? Why I, Ohio State? I, I was I was an old uh, football player. My first ever football coach. He uh, he always used to wear the you know old Buckeye stuff. I'm like, oh, what's that? And um, so I guess from the very beginning, that's that's kind of the school that I repped and kind of like learned about I I went there last year kind of explored the campus a little bit I I caught a 
a football game there and just kind of spend a couple of days um, just kind of like in awe of the, you know, of the <clears throat> campus and stuff like that. It was, it was pretty surreal. So um, how, how could you like kind of run us through how was your experience going there? Yeah, I mean, obviously you said I was from Paris. I'm from Paris. So I, I think at the time, Paris, the population was 10,000 when I went to Ohio State. And I think on any given day with the faculty, Ohio State has close to 82,000 people on campus. So you think it's eight, wow. times, eight times bigger than your hometown, yeah, right? And it was huge. So you think about, you know, being from Paris, there's no bus. Like you don't have to learn how to ride the bus somewhere you know, or like all that. So that was like a huge, um, yeah, transition because you have 80,000 people on campus and one day you've never seen those many people before. And then you go to a football game and there's like 104,000 people or whatever that stadium fits. So yeah, it's insane. yeah, I, I was a little bit, uh, in awe at the start, but you get used to it. I mean, it's fun, man. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm married now, but I had some fun times for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. To say the least. Yeah keep it PG, but yeah, I know it was a good time. Like you, <laughs> you, uh, lots of, you know, in 21, you're, you're playing division one hockey. Um, we weren't very good at the time. We went to the, the tournament my first year, the, the NCAA tournament, but, uh, yeah, good time. Lots of bars, lots of places to go. Yeah. It's a lot of girls. It's yeah. crazy. Like when I went down like the main strip, like it's like a whole little city in that campus, like compared to like Canadian colleges, like it's, it is a, drastic difference like there's so many places to visit and like like the halls there like we went into like even the basketball arena was like really nicely prepared yeah. obviously the football arena like like funded like crazy so yeah they they got a um the practice football facility there um it's so high tech that if let's say they're going to like lsu and it's supposed to rain they can actually make it rain in the because it's an enclosed stadium they can make it rain so they practice all their oh, wow. plays on on it raining or they can kick field goals inside this place like wow. it's insane i didn't know that. Uh, i think they put like 300 million just into the dressing room part of it like the training Jeez. part like money is no object yeah sure. for sure wow i did what not know that that's really cool yeah it's insane what was it like for the hockey program wise i mean it's obviously gotten better this is I mean, that was 11 years ago for me. So the hockey wasn't like, I mean, it probably still isn't this, even the second sport. Like the first sport obviously is football and then it's men's basketball and then it's women's basketball and then it's men's hockey. So you're not even like the big guy on campus, so to speak. Like, you know, if you were to go to North Dakota or Wisconsin or Michigan, you're not even like, you tell a girl you play for the hockey team, they don't even know there's a hockey team. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's changed now because obviously they've had some success, so. I was there for two years. I, my goal was to go then. Well, I, I went in as a, as a boy and came out a man. I mean, you, you have so much time to train and um, came out a man in different ways, but uh, you have so much time to train and, and, and get stronger and uh, yeah, two games a week. So I think, I mean, to put it in perspective, I was like 170 pounds maybe when I went in there and I came in, I came out at like 195, you okay. know, you just, you have the time to get stronger and you do. And that's why I think college is, is very, very important for that. Yeah. I don't want to like keep too long on the subject, but what was like, it's always interesting to hear like day to day um, like, of a, of a student athlete. So how, how was like, yeah. was it hard to time manage it all or how was that kind of experience? Yeah. So it's a grind. I mean, it's funny enough. No one's ever asked me that's a really good question. So you, you get up, Usually the practice is like smack dab in the middle of the day at like two thirty. So you gotta fit in all your classes before practice because after practice you have mandatory study hall. So you have like a card, you have to swipe in the study hall, they see if you're there, they see when you leave. So hmm. I think as a freshman you have eight hours of mandatory study hall a week. So you think you you know, you're not doing it on the weekend. So you gotta at least get like an hour and a half in during the week every single day. Yeah. Um, so you're doing classes all the way up to two get over to practice practices are long in college are a bit of a grind. So it's like two 30 to four. And then you work out from probably five till six. And then you, you go to study hall and find a way to eat. So you're leaving your place at like seven in the morning and you're not getting home till 
eight thirty at night. So it's a bit of a grind, but you learn how to do it. And mm-hmm. yeah. You don't go to every class, so <laughs> you can sleep in here and there. That, I mean, I'm not trying to say that you should do that, but that's something that's. Uh, I mean, I was going there for the hockey. I wasn't going there to get a, to, to get a degree, but uh, right. no, it's definitely a grind for sure. People don't know that though. They think it's like a, a walk in the park, but you got to grind it, man. Like as far as the the study halls and stuff, that's that stuff's no joke. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah. that's interesting. That's awesome. Yeah. And then, um, what was it like? We're having him on tomorrow, obviously, your brother. Were you guys in the NCAA at the same point at any time? Or what was it like to have him also go in the Division One pathway? Yeah, no, Benny's five years younger than me. So we weren't, uh, and I was a true freshman. So when I went in at 18, he was 13 years old. So, but uh, what was yeah i mean it was cool to see him get a scholarship i know uh ohio state was offering him and oh, he didn't uh i think he wanted i mean if you kind of look at his hockey career obviously he played in pembroke but then he went to penticton where i played before that lived at the same village so i think after that he kind of wanted to make his own uh, path didn't want to follow in my footsteps so to speak so um he chose clarkson and yeah, four years at a, at a very nice school. Got him a really good degree, and I think it's worked out for him. He's in the NHL now. Awesome. Wow. So, yeah. so let's hop in then now. We'll jump to pro. We'll leave Nate's Ohio State behind. But obviously, <laughs> you, you lit it up and led the team in scoring your second year at Ohio State. What was the decision like to go pro? Um. Yeah, I mean, when I, when I, I think it was, I was dropped by Carolina, so when they come calling and they want you to play, they want you to sign a contract, you're like, I want to be a hockey player, so um, it's kind of hard to turn down. So yeah, I, they, after my second year, I was up for the Hobie Baker, which was cool. I didn't win, obviously, but uh, won a few awards in the CCHA. And I don't know, you guys know my old man a little bit, right? I, I do. They don't. You do? Okay. Yeah. I mean, he was always a firm believer of before you move on to the next level, you better dominate the one you're at. So um, we felt the need that. Uh, not that I thought I was way too good for NCAA, but we felt the need uh, that it was time to move on and, and get better in a different league. So Carolina came calling and I signed. Awesome. So I saw the, the uh, go ahead. I saw the video of your you getting draft. That looks like such a cool moment and like to be a part of the draft. Um, for Carolina, yeah. And you're sitting. Yes, yeah, yeah. That was what was that? Yeah. So I, 12, 12 years ago now. So it's, uh, it's crazy to think that that flew by, but yeah. Um, little funny story. So I was ready to go 16th overall. And so the draft, you're at the draft and like when it kind of comes up to where you think you're going to be taken, I mean, you obviously don't know, but you see there the camera, like TSN, they're, they're like finding, they know before anybody else who's oh, getting yeah. drafted so they can have their camera ready. So, you know, 16 comes around and like, we're looking, the camera's not showing. I'm like getting mad and uh, looking back at it. It's so silly because I was so lucky just to even get drafted. But uh, then Jake Gardner went and then I'm like this Minnesota high school, like who, who gets drafted from there? Like at the time you're so upset and uh, yeah. you're, just a cock, you're just a cocky kid. And so obviously they do the first round one night and then you go, you go home. So I didn't get drafted the, in the first round and, I thought it was the end of the world. Looking back at it, I'm so embarrassed because I was so upset and I like didn't talk to my parents. <laughs> like, oh, just, no. just the most like just outrageous that I would even think like that. And yeah, I went drafted. Uh, okay. I went the second round pretty early the next day. I think Ray smacked that with Mill 45th, and uh, here I am, 12 years later. So it's been a good ride. Cool. What yeah. about getting drafted out of the BC? That's not obviously, especially here in Ontario. I'm sure you grew up with it. People don't really think of the NCAA route. It's starting to come more now, but even so, 12 years ago, that wasn't a common route. What was it like getting drafted out of there compared to a major junior? Yeah, I mean, I think the reason we went out there is because um, Kyle Turris went pretty high the year before out of that league. So he okay. kind of put that league on the map. I think he went like second overall out of Burnaby or whatever the, whatever the number was. And uh, so I think people were like, oh, that's a, that's a good league. So that was part of our decision-making and on, uh, on going out there because he kind of paved like the map of, Hey, I'm this BCHL is a pretty legitimate league. So let's scouts are going to come. And so we went out there and on a, you know, we took a chance and it worked out. So right in now we're there to professional. What was first game, first goal? What was all the welcome to the NHL moment? 
Yeah. Um, it's funny. We we're hanging. I just hung out some jerseys because we just got our basement done. But uh, I have my first game jersey. My first game was a bit unorthodox. It was in Helsinki, Finland. It was when they were doing like the NHL premieres where two teams would go over and play uh, in a different, obviously in a different country. So um, made the team out of camp. We played uh, Minnesota, Minnesota Wild in Helsinki, Finland, which was pretty cool. Um, Paul Maurice was our coach. Um, you know, Jeff Skinner, the big rookie year he had was my roommate. So it was a pretty cool thing to do. Uh, I guess welcome to the NHL moment. I got an assist my first game, which was cool. Um, got some smoked by Cal Clutterbuck, like just absolutely oh, like oh, no. lit up. Yeah, lit up, you know, head down or maybe like following my pass. Like, well, that was a nice pass. He just lit me up, um, which is hilarious because I tried to fight him like years later because <laughs> of it. I didn't remember or I, I didn't forget. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was cool. The only the only downside is my parents didn't get to come watch my first game because it was in Finland. And uh, so that was kind of the only downfall. But other than that, it was uh, it was pretty cool. I mean, I still remember it like it was yesterday. It was uh, 11 years ago. Wow. So what was your mindset sweet. back then? Like, did you find it like, I mean, obviously you'd be practicing, but did you find it like hard to adapt from, I mean, obviously like college to, to professional level, like, was there any strategies or ways that you that kind of helped you along the way? I mean, I no one no one can tell you like how it's gonna be. So yeah, you can talk to everybody, and everyone's got a different experience. And For sure. So I didn't know what to expect. I mean, obviously coming from college, I had some confidence, and I just knew, hey, kind of do what got you here. So I just stuck to that, and um, it worked. I made the team out of camp, like I said, and yeah, I mean. I wish, uh, I wish somebody told me how it was going to go, but it probably wouldn't have went that way anyway. So, um, I, I was had some confidence as a, as a younger guy and, uh, tried to use it and, and it worked. That's kind of, I know it's a boring answer, but that's no, yeah, the, that's, the way it happened. That's fair enough. So, yeah. That's, that's pretty wise. Yeah. And what was your realization to the like, uh, like you listened to spitting chicklets and stuff like that. And they always tell the funny stories, but just going from college to the life, you're making all this money all of a sudden versus being an on college athlete and you're, you're living the good life or whatever you want to call it. What was that your first realization of that? Yeah. I mean, it was, yeah, it's funny. Cause I was just telling my wife this story. Uh, so when you sign, you get like a bonus, but like, you, you know, you do, you do grade school call or high school and college, but nobody ever really teaches you like taxes, you know, like, so you're like, ah, oh, I'm going to make this much money. So I think my, Carolina, they give you a bonus, but they give you it in increments. So, like, let's say your first year is like a ninety thousand dollar bonus. They're not going to give you ninety right away. They're going to give you like twenty, thirty, blah blah blah. Right. So, uh, my first bonus was like, I don't know, it was like twenty five thousand, and I was so like, never seen that kind of money before at the time, obviously. And so I get the check, and it's it's like eleven thousand dollars. So I like call my mom. I'm like, Hey, mom, I got my bonus, but like I'm missing half of it. And she's like, what'd you get? I was like 11,800. And she's like, what were you supposed to get? I'm like 25. She's like, you got it all. So I was like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> like no crazy. one told me, you know, Hey, you're going to get a $90,000 bonus, but it's actually going to be 40, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uncle Sam takes it right there. So, <laughs> I mean, that was kind of a funny moment that I can, that I can think of, but it was so long ago. I mean, yeah, you're getting some, some pretty nice paychecks for sure, to say the least. It's awesome. Yeah. Do you remember your first goal memory too? I, I actually, I saw the video recently and um, people would talk about your little hop. When you <laughs> got it. Yeah. Um, yeah, my first goal was, uh, I think, January 1st. So it took me a while. I mean, I, I started the year there. I played like 10, 11 games and then they sent me to the minors uh to go down there and play just because i was playing fourth line minutes so i got called back up on december 31st i think 2010 and then obviously new year's 2011 maybe maybe it was 2009 2010 but anyways yeah i remember it i mean i had a stupid little hop in the air um <laughs> i mean you, you rehearse your first goal and you guys do it all the time probably when you're younger on the pond you're like when i score my first goal i'm gonna do this this and this but when you actually do it you have no idea what you're gonna do so oh, yeah. um yeah, it was a funny little hop, but I, I remember doing it. I remember hopping. And, <laughs> no, 
not thinking anything of it. And then obviously your phone blows up at the, at the from all your buddies making fun of you. <laughs> yeah, they're just jealous. Yeah, they're jealous, but they're also like giving it to you. Like that's what you that's what you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> First goal and you did a bunny op. <laughs> yeah, but I will say, like, Mar- uh, Martin Brodeur was the goalie right before I went to score that. So, like, a couple guys scored, I think it was, like, 5-2 on Marty Brodeur. They yanked him. And then first shot on the new goalie, which is Johan Hedberg. I mean, you always remember to you score your first goal on Johan Hedberg. Uh, I scored, which is hilarious. But, wow. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. We, uh, we talked about a little before the show. What about Walker? What did you get from him? We had his kid on. Recently, it's a little um, connection. He played in the OHL, and what was it like? Uh, I know you didn't. Uh, you were just on the roster with him, but what was it like with Scott Walker, a Cambridge guy? Yeah, I mean, a great. I mean, from what I remember, I don't know if he remembered me. I was just a pimple face rookie, but uh, yeah, I mean, great dressing room guy. Obviously, he plays the game hard, or he played the game hard. Um, you know, went to the went to the areas where not a lot of people went to tough too for for not being that big in stature so um i mean i knew i was a nerd going into the nhl i knew who everybody was so when i saw him it was pretty cool to to meet him and and finally get to be in the same dressing room as guys like that for sure so how was uh playing in vancouver i know kind of a little research saying that was your your uh your dream team to go to your favorite team as a as a kid so how was how was your first season there and was it a surreal experience yeah, it was cool. I mean, like you said, it was my first, uh, or it was my boyhood team. Yeah. My older brother was a massive Pavel Bray fan, and then obviously you want to do what your brother does. So I was a giant uh, Vancouver Canucks fan. So um, I got traded there from Carolina right into Torts. Uh, yeah, it was cool. I mean, I think about it all the time. It was, a, it was a cool moment in my life getting to play. You know, not a lot of people get to say they played for their favorite team growing up. So. Yeah. Um, took full advantage of it. Was 24, playing in the NHL in Vancouver. It was cool, man. Like, uh, yeah, That's a lot awesome. of cool stories. Do you have any funny Tortorella stories? I got a, a ton. I got a ton. I mean, <laughs> can you fire a couple? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I could. I, I'm actually really, it's so funny now because I've told Torts this, but uh, I mean, I hate, I did not like him as a coach when I played with him in Vancouver. Now I have him in Columbus, but. I was like a 24 year old, not thick skin. And obviously with torts, you got to have thick skin. And so, um, I'm just trying to think of which one I could, which one I should tell you. <laughs> I mean, I tell this one about the city. And so, I mean, it's, no one had a good year that year. I don't know if you guys seen it. Like torts had a five year deal and he got fired after one. So it just was a gong show. And so we're like one game, the tort or the twins are playing. Like, can I, can I say sh- like shit? Like, I swear on here a little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the twins are playing like shit and no one's playing well with them. Like they had Alexander Burroughs with them, Chris Higgins, uh, this Mike Santarelli kid. So whatever, no one was playing good with them. And I, and I was on the fourth line centerman. I played like four minutes a game. So he's like looking up and down the lineup or along the bench. And he's like, Hank, Danny and Delps. And I'm like, he's fucking like he didn't say my name and he and i'm like i looked i even kind of looked at him like he's like yeah you're going i'm like jesus christ okay like and i look at the twins i'm like sorry guys like you know but they were unbelievable so we're playing against st louis first shift they get an assist and like these guys were so good like yeah it was literally like playing pick up hockey with them it was like all of a sudden, I was, like, making passes that I shouldn't have been making. I hadn't played in, like, two periods. So, whatever. I get an assist. I'm like, all right. So, next shift, I go out. I'm still I'm still with them. We're, like, playing unbelievable. Intermission. I'm like, okay, he's going to switch the lines up in intermission. Start the next period with them. I score. I'm like, Jesus oh, wow. Christ. Like, this is <laughs> – and, like, they were really good. The twins are like, hey, just play your game. Like, we're going to get our points on the power play. Like, don't worry about it. But when I scored the goal, they both said – they both assisted it, which is cool. But um, so whatever, we finished the game. I like goal and assist. I call my dad. I'm like, dad, I'm like, I'm fucking playing with the twins. Like, he's like, dude, this is unbelievable. I'm like, I'm going to sign an eight year deal. Like, this is great. I'm like, so cocky. So Cloud the nine. next game, the next game we're in uh, LA. It's like hockey night in Canada. And I'm like, okay, hey. I go in for morning skate. I'm on their line. First line. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like, here we go. Like a better, you know, these guys are so easy to play with. So 
I'm warming up before the game and Torts comes up and he's like, you ready to go tonight? I'm like, yeah. He goes, don't fuck it up. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Good. Like these guys are so good. He goes, just to let you know, you have the shortest leash. And I'm like, he goes, you make one mistake. You're off the line. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> like not, not what you want to hear. Yeah, no, for so, sure. uh, like second shift, I go to dump the puck in and the NHL, the guys are so good. They just bat it out of the air. And like, I think it was like Drew Doughty and they like, come back down the other, we get hemmed in our zone. And I'm like, for fuck's sakes, like I get off, not on their line anymore. So I'm like, all right, maybe the intermission, like we'll be all right. Don't play it. single shift the rest of the game. So, oh, no. <laughs> so I call my dad after it's like a different phone call. I'm like, yeah. uh, he's like, yeah, whatever. So the next day we have practice and I come in and the lines are up on the board and I'm on extra. I'm not even on one, two, three, four. I'm oh. on extra. So I'm like, here we go. Torts had, doesn't have good video sessions. Like they're, they're tough video sessions. So he gets to my turnover where he took me off the line. And like all the older guys that have been there, Roberto Luongo, Kevin Bx, so all these guys are like, this is one of the best lines we've ever heard. But so Torts is like, and here we have Delps thinking he's with the Sedins. He can make a fucking play. All I was trying to do was dump it in. Yeah. Like that's it. And he's like trying to dipsy doodle through the, look at him here. This is unbelievable. Oh, turnover. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm like, this is awful. And he goes, uh, Delps, before that game, or before that game, I put you on the Twins line. Twins line. You were on, you were in the doghouse on the fourth. I put you in the penthouse on the first. And now you're in the fucking outhouse. You're not even in the lineup. Yeah. <laughs> and that was it. And I was, I didn't play a single shift with them ever again. Wow. Yeah. Just yeah. So, I mean, I play, I, I always tell people I lasted uh, four periods with the Sedins, but whatever. It was a good story. <laughs> yeah. No, that's. That lasts you a lifetime. That, that's awesome. I mean, that's torch for you, though. Like, he's a great, great coach. He'll bat. He'll go to bat for his players. But if you don't do what he asks, you're in trouble. So, <laughs> I was in the outhouse. Wow, that's cut. That's almost that's awesome. a bad story. You're so close to being with him. Yeah, I mean, what? I mean, whatever. I'd, this was seven years ago, so I've I forgot it a little bit. But it's a good <laughs> story I tell people. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I got I got a ton of those stories. He was. He was a character, that's for sure. <laughs> Sounds like And it. then that goes right into what we were going to ask you next is the Sedin twins. We saw your post of them on the Instagram when they retired. What were they like? You said they were awesome off the ice and on the ice. Yeah, they were world-class players, but they were also world-class guys. Like, I mean, you want to talk about, like, guys that uh, were first to the rink every day. Unbelievable shape. Like, they were first and second in fitness testing. Um you know, like they come up to you on the plane and be like, where are you going for dinner? And you're like, Oh, I don't know. Never been to Chicago before. Okay. Well, you're coming with us, you know, like as a, as a young guy, when like people do that, yeah, it goes a long way and it makes you remember. So, um, and I'd said this a, a couple of days ago to somebody, um, my brother was getting married and he's like, Hey, I need some, some, uh, you know, raffle items. So I, I called the city and said, can you guys send me, two jerseys you know like they and they didn't have to but they did yeah. you know like just little things like that go a long way for me i mean i'm a small town guy i'm a very sentimental guy and they were yeah i have nothing bad not a single thing bad thing to say about those guys unbelievable cool yeah the little things go the long way and that's yeah they seem like great guys that's that's really cool that you had the chance to kind of have build that relationship with them as well yeah of course as someone who played in the NHL, what would you what would you say the ratio? This might be a weird question, but what would you say the ratio of players being like down to earth, really good people to like kind of cocky people who couldn't really care less about you? Do you find like there's there's more people who really care about you than not? Oh yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean there's only there's only a handful, not even a handful of guys. I mean I've been on six teams and I played 11 years and I, I could probably count on maybe two, one, but maybe two hands of guys I didn't like, you know? So it's like for, you know, 95% of guys are, are just like me. They just want to be there and they just want to have a good time and they want to win. And, you know, they want to have stories to tell one day and uh, make some good money. And, and that's it. I mean, I think everybody wants to win the Stanley Cup, so that's their first priority. But at the same time, they want to have a good time doing it. So, yeah, I got a, I've had a lot of but made a lot of buddies along the way for sure. Cool. Yeah. Good yeah. Because you see, you see a lot of people 
or like in the NHL and all sports, football included. Like I guess you could say there's a there's a game face you put on when you're on TV. You're you're kind of more in the zone. You look kind of more serious, but it's cool to get a little background on what people are like off television and all that. Yeah, like it's funny when I got traded to Vancouver, you look at the roster and like you're like, oh, BX is a prick to play against. Like, you know, maybe he's a prick, you know, off the ace burrows. But you get there and they're unbelievable guys, you know. So you're like, oh, it's just like you said, just putting a game face on and got to go do a job. And then like I've heard Brad Marchand's an unreal guy, you know, and he's like, I fucking hate playing against them. Yeah. But, you know, I so I think they're all just good. I mean, like I said, for the most part, I think they're all just good dudes and they just want to have a good time and win, win a Stanley Cup, you know. And I mean, at the end of the day, a lot of these guys come from small towns like like we do. So it's they still got their buddies back home. They go fishing with. They still got, you know, and they're still in a group chat with guys that don't even play in the NHL. So yeah. I think they're all good. I think for the most part, they're good guys. There are some guys that you're yeah. like, fuck off. But for the most part, <laughs> yeah. they're, yeah, for the most part. They're good dudes. For yeah, sure. to add yeah, that's sense that's to that. definitely a really cool thing to see to hear on like like a behind the scenes because a lot of people don't get to hear about what happens after the game's done. You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we have like in Vancouver, we had a thing called uh, Sky Bar. So if we won, like in the in the plan, it would get like you'd be you'd be like you're in a club. You know, there'd be like beats going and you know <laughs> drinks and you know guys taking their shirt off. Like it was fun. We call it Sky Bar. So it was. I mean, just stuff like that. Obviously, you don't see uh, you don't see on camera, but it's a good time, and um, yeah, we had a good time. Sure, that's the NHL lifestyle there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so we got. We, I think I, I'm assuming you guys checked out this video too, but I watched it a couple of times to really get a grip on it. Uh, what What are your comments on seeing "I Will Remember You" with Sarah McLaughlin? <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was probably. I mean probably one of the cooler, cooler things I've ever done in my life. I mean, Sarah McLaughlin, obviously we all know that song. Um, yeah, it was like a dice and ice thing with Vancouver. And usually every year they make the rookies go up and do something, but like, you know, act out a scene from Jerry Maguire or something, but I wasn't a rookie and a Sedins came up to me and said, Hey, we got a surprise for you. Do you mind doing like the rookie act with the rookies? And I was like, okay. They're like, just trust me. You're going to love it. I'm like, okay. So we were behind backstage and I saw her walking. I'm like, fucking, is that Sarah McLaughlin? Like, I, I didn't think anything of it. I thought, hey, that girl looked like Sarah McLaughlin. You know, and then we went up on the stage and then she sat down on her piano and I'm like, oh, I'm running with this. I mean, like, as a music guy, like a guy that really loves music, I mean, my mom's a massive Sarah McLaughlin fan. I'm like, I know some of the guys on the team are going to try to sing this and like not, and make it a joke, but like, I'm, I'm, fucking gonna sing with her so i'm gonna try you know i don't know how good i'm gonna sound but yeah so i told her i loved her and then uh everyone like chirped me for her and then uh i got a cool photo i'm like she's got her arm around me and she says to zach with all my love sarah mclaughlin so it's a pretty cool thing so definitely a cool uh thing to hang up in the in the basement for sure it's funny to see in the video you can definitely tell you're the only one who really kind of cared for that everyone else was just staring. yeah i'm like well i'm never gonna do this again you know so i'm not gonna just make a joke of it i'm gonna actually try to sing with her you know <laughs> yeah. why not <laughs> you, did, you did a good job so but yeah well, i appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> thanks awesome. uh when did music come into it oh, we're gonna talk about it later but might as well talk about it now you we see your live live sessions uh, with people from Cleveland and stuff like that. When was music a thing for you? When did that become something? Uh, I mean, music's always been a thing for me. I come from a very music oriented family. Like you know, just growing up, it was uh, always emphasized how kind of important music was for your mood at the time, or you know, whatever the case may be. So I've always been super into music, and then. When I got to college, my roommate had a guitar. My little brother had a guitar too. They didn't play much. So I was like, I'm going to pick this up. And once you learn a few chords, you're hooked. And then you learn some more. And then you have a few drinks and you start singing. And people don't think you're horrible. So um, it kind of just snowballs from there. Um, Been fortunate enough to do a couple weddings. Like, I I don't know if you guys remember the hockey player, David Booth. He played for the least. So I got hired to play his wedding. I played him and his wife down the aisle. Cool. I played cool. Yeah, I played at uh, Dale Weiss's wedding. He plays in Montreal now. 
Yeah. Uh, so I've got to do a couple of teammates' weddings, which is cool. Um, yeah, I mean, if I wasn't a hockey player, I'd be trying to make, be making it in music, but it uh, seems like that'd be just as hard to make it. So, yeah, always been a music fan, for sure. Do you find it cool to be, like, have a have a diverse area of what you can do? Because a lot of people usually try really hard with one thing, which isn't wrong, but it, I think it's also it's good to have a... a uh, like a diverse area of skills, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, do you yeah, find I mean, it cool to be able to play guitar and, like, do a little bit with music and be a pro hockey player? Yeah, I mean, I don't. I like to be a little bit more dimensional, for sure. I mean, I, I've always wanted to do stand-up comedy, too, so that's kind of my next thing I'm tackling. Okay, um, cool. I really want to get on stage and, and do stand-up comedy. So just keeping things interesting, man, especially when you have two kids, the days get... Uh, uh, the days are a grind so you try to find ways to, to not make the grind but yeah I've always been just been interested in I mean hockey's my life it's everything that I've ever worked for but I don't I don't look at myself as just a hockey player anymore yeah that's mm -hmm. fair that's and I think that's um that's really cool <laughs> to be able to do because like I said a lot of people work towards one goal but ending up doing a lot more than just that makes you a more developed and better human being i think well i you say he's calling me a good guy i appreciate that yeah basically <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> thank you um back Go on the hockey topic we'll just touch on it short um what was your quick time in buffalo like playing an hour and a half away from home if that um, yeah i mean I, buffalo was bittersweet for me because we, we sucked and everybody knew it um we were trying to tank to get mcdavid so it was, you know, the hockey, I mean, I, it wasn't that good of a year. Um, but, the, but the positive from that is um, right around March, my mom got diagnosed with cancer when I was in Buffalo. So I, in order to, to like visit with her, I wasn't far away. Like you said, I was an hour and a half away. So I got to go home uh, like every day. Um, and then towards the end of the season, obviously when we were out of the playoff, we were, we were out of the playoffs in November, but um the coach Ted Nolan came up to me and said, Hey, like, I know what's going on. If you just want to play games and go home on practice days and take practices off, like we're okay with that. So what I would do is like, I wouldn't practice. I would go home and then they would fly me to uh, Washington and I would play in Washington and then I'd fly back home and then they would fly me to the next city. So like they spent a ton of money that they didn't have to do, but they knew the situation with my mom. So that makes me like very grateful for playing there. So it's, it's kind of a bittersweet thing. Cause like I said, we sucked, like we weren't good at all. We were trying to not be good. We were trying to get the draft lottery, obviously for McDavid, they got Eichel, which is a good player too, but, um, but I got to go home a lot. So I'll always remember that time for sure. Yeah. That's, that's good to hear. Like as a big organization like that, like they care about the players and stuff like that. Like they, they're not always, you know, business, business. Like that's, that's really good to hear. And I'm sure that that was a great move for you to, you know, you know, have, have the time to spend with your mom or something like that. Like it really worked around your schedule as well. So that's good to hear. Yeah. I mean, I, to, for them to, for them to do that, like, Hey, you're not practicing you're, and we're going to fly you to all the, all the games like yeah, that exactly. to me was like, made me want to stay, you know, as opposed to wanting to get out of there because we weren't very good. For sure. Yeah. And then your, your quick time in Minnesota too, well, and before we really get into the ending part in Cleveland and Columbus, and what was your short time in Minnesota and, and Iowa? And then also, I, I don't, I'm assuming this is you because I don't know who else it could be, but my brother told me, so he was playing in Paris right in, in that time frame when, when they won or whatever. And he said, uh, Christmas break or something, you came for a practice with them. And they were like, who is this guy? You walked on, you went bar down from the blue line or something like that. And they were like, what the heck? And then they realized like you were in the AHL or whatever. Is that a true story? I don't, maybe, I, yeah, I don't know, maybe. You don't remember? <laughs> no. Like, did, you, did you practice with them at all? I did, yeah. Okay, uh, so that must be a true story then. I practiced with them at one point. Who was the coach? Was it, uh, who was the coach at that time? Oh, I don't know. I think Todd maybe had me out, maybe. Yeah, it was, yeah, like, just when I think it was when you were home or whatever visiting, and he's yeah. Us, he says, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I really loved Minnesota and Iowa. My kid was born there, so he's American. Well, he's dual, but my firstborn was born there. Um, got to play in the Stanley Cup playoffs, which was cool. 
Oh, wow. um, a little bittersweet too, because uh, that from Buffalo going into that next season when I signed with Minnesota and the first day of training camp, my mom passed away. So I went home uh, for like two weeks. I hadn't even met anybody in Minnesota yet. So then when I went back to Minnesota, they said, uh, we're going to put you in the A because you haven't played hockey in two weeks. And then I went to the A and I tore my uh, labrum and I had surgery and I was out for six months. Oh, so wow. it was uh, like a weird, a weird time. But uh, like I said, again, uh, when she passed away and I had that surgery, they let me come home till like, December or whatever it was until I was skating again. That's probably where I went on the ice because I was starting to skate again. And uh, Chuck Fletcher was the GM there. And he said, don't, I was only on a one year contract too. So I was going to miss the entire year. And he said, don't worry, we'll resign you already for next year, which was made me, you know, peace of mind. And then uh, I worked hard and got back to, uh, I played the last two games in Minnesota, Minnesota, scored a goal, and then went into the, to the Stanley Cup playoffs against the Dallas Stars. So, crazy time really really cool like i thought the nhl was hard it actually gets harder when it's fucking playoffs which <laughs> i don't know how it gets harder it's a hard to get anyways but uh yeah great time in minnesota my wife would love to go back for sure yeah that was great that's obviously great what they did with your mom we're sorry to, we're sorry to hear about that that's so cool that oh no yeah no worries both teams were able to support you in that and uh let you be with your family and at home yeah, okay. But jumping into currently, uh, what was it like going to Cleveland? And we know you've been up a little bit with Columbus, but it seems like you kind of found your place in Cleveland. Would you say that, that you feel you, like you kind of found your place? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm the captain there. Me and my, like, we own a house there. So it's like, you know, it just makes sense. Um, we love it. It's only four hours from here. So it's just super easy for the kids and the wife to scoot home if we're on a long road trip. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess you could say I found a home there. I had a really good year there a couple of years ago. Uh, obviously, had got injured last year, but I definitely, definitely could call it home for a couple more years for sure. Um, you know, and then going back to Columbus, full circle, going to Ohio State, and yeah, then going back to Columbus, back to the state of Ohio. If you're a Buckeye in that state, everybody loves you, so they they welcome you with or opened up with with the, their arms. So I mean, I I think I would love to stay there. I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not the one sign who's offered the contract, but uh, if they offered me again, I'd take it for sure. What yeah. would you say about like this is all based on what I've listened to on other hockey podcasts like Spit and Chicklets and stuff like that, and how drastically hockey culture has changed in Cleveland in that before, like I don't know, ten years ago, they when the Barons were there, they get like two hundred fans and every post I see on Instagram from the Cleveland team, it seems pretty packed. What are the fans like and how much better has it gone? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I even noticed it from when I played on other teams, like going into Cleveland. Um, yeah. You're like, it's an unreal rank, but there's going to be nobody there. So, but they won the Calder cup like three years ago. So obviously that fans are going to hop on that bandwagon. Right. So I mean, we got to we get to play in the same rink as the Cleveland Cavaliers. The production's unbelievable because they had LeBron there for however many years. So, like their production is top notch. Uh, there's like it's you know like the jumbotron for the Dallas Cowboys, like that massive. Yeah. Like yeah. we have hockey's version of that in our rink. Like it's, <laughs> wow. it goes from like goal line to goal line. Like it's massive. That's crazy. Because, because of because of LeBron, right? So you have that production and the Cavaliers and the monsters are owned by the same person so you have the same people working you have that world-class organization with the cavaliers with the ahl team so it only makes sense as to why they drew those fans in right um the rink's unbelievable obviously the winning helps but yeah like really undercover hockey town for sure cool, yeah. yeah i love it i mean it's a blue collar town and it's like burning to the ground right now with all the riots but uh oh, yeah. Yeah, we that's another that's another discussion. But yeah, it's uh I've heard them I've heard them like chirping on spit and chicklets, but then they say it's a good it's a good spot now. It's definitely a good spot now for sure. With Ohio, do you find it I know you mentioned, but it's cool to have that kind of full circle. You started out well obviously you started out in, in Paris and Brantford, but to come back starting your kind of more pro career in Ohio and doing a full circle, that would that sounds like a really cool experience as well yeah i mean it was weird like when i went to columbus's training camp i had there was like people there wearing delphi jerseys from ohio state eight years ago oh wow. you know so it's like and hockey's only gotten better i know columbus gets a bad rap 
for, for being a hockey town, but like, it's a great, great town. I mean, people love, love hockey there. So, um, it's just in the middle of nowhere, but great city. And yeah, it was cool coming back for sure. Cause like you said, once you're a buck guy, everyone's so loyal to you. So it just yeah. so happened. Yeah. This kid from Paris, Ontario, would have to be a fucking buck guy, which is hilarious. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. What was uh, it like witnessing their playoff run? I don't know if you were Black Ace and it all, or even just being in the NHL team, what was it like seeing Columbus? I think people really started recognizing it, like you said, as a hockey town during that run last year. Yeah, so we were in our playoffs, too, in Cleveland, but I got called up uh, game four against Tampa when they swept them. So I was supposed to play. Boone Jenner didn't feel well, or he had, like, a nagging injury. So I took warm-ups, and I'm like, fuck, I'm going to play, like, you know, they could close this out tonight. And then like 10 minutes before puck drop, Boone, was, Boone Jenner was like, I'm, I'm good. So I took my stuff off and I just watched it upstairs. But it was nuts. Yeah, like to have that playoff or the playoff round victory because uh, they hadn't won one before was pretty cool. And then obviously doing it against Tampa, who had that crazy good year. So they were meeting business. Yeah, it was uh, – I definitely think that enhanced people's passion for hockey too, for sure. Yeah, so I, I was in Florida with my uncle, and we had tickets to game five in Florida. In oh, yeah. Dallas, and we were driving back, and we had eighth row to game six in Columbus. And then we, Columbus won the first game. Like, oh, it's happening for sure. Like, we're getting in game five at least. And then Columbus swept. Yeah, so we crazy. either of the games. Yeah, you, you, you got robbed there. But, yeah, no one thought they were going to sweep, obviously. Yeah. But got a high goalie, and... Played well, then they ran into Boston. And then our, our last thing we'll touch on quick is the Spangler. That's obviously got to be cool. We see the jersey right behind you there. Yeah. What was that, what was it like playing in Europe? You said you touched, uh, you went played in Finland your first NHL game, but um, maybe like did was your family able to make it out? What was it like playing in Europe? Yeah, it was cool. Like I mean, I grew up watching the Spangler Cup, so um, to to be selected for that team, Ron Francis was doing the selections. Uh, he was my old GM slash coach in Carolina. So um, he called my agent. I had to get permission from Columbus to release me. And yeah, we flew out there Christmas Eve day. Uh, we were supposed to be playing on Boxing Day. So it was a bit of a whirlwind. Like I, my poor wife, like traveling with a, two, a year and a half old on a plane for 10 hours, like fucking shoot me. Like I would, I would never do that again, ever. Like as far as with the kid. Yeah. So we get there and all the games are at eight o'clock and like my kids bedtimes at seven. So it's like, you know, my wife, Cassandra's like trying to bring the kid to the game. He's like grumpy, you know, he's a year and a half. Yeah. He doesn't know anything. And so she got like the shit kicked out of her the whole week. Cause he had an ear infection, pink eye <laughs> oh, no. and something else. So then like, I'm like, Hey sweetie, like I got to take a nap here. You mind get that, you know, like, <laughs> so like, and she was great. And, uh, yeah, I mean, bitter. Like, it sucked because like we could have wanted to shoot out and that we didn't. But uh, I would one thousand percent do that again. Um, like I said, super cool. I we just put that jersey up today, actually, which was sweet. So, uh, um, yeah, I would definitely do it again. I'm hoping they they ask me again for sure. And then is that um, we obviously know you want to play for Cleveland or anywhere in America, but is is did that kind of open up to Europe? Just being in the back of your head. Yeah, I mean, when you go over there, everyone thinks you're going to the Spangler Cup to get noticed for Europe teams, like European teams. So when I went over there, and I played well, too, so it just helped. And uh, I had so many teams offering me, and I'm like, Cass, like, I said to my wife, I'm like, you want to go to fucking Switzerland? Like, what do you want to do? You know, you want to go to Switzerland, the K? Like, what do you want to do? And then when I flew back uh, after, I think Columbus got a a win that I was – you know, getting some nice offers. So they, they ended up offering me something completely different and way better than any of those teams for two more years. And then, you know, when you're 30 and you have, to, we were having another kid on the way, you have that security of two years. So it was hard to turn down. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I Europe, I would all, I would definitely play Europe. I, I'd have to you know, convince my wife a little bit to move, but um, yeah, I mean, I'll play till they take my skates away. So if, if I'm 33 and, and these guys don't want me and, you know, some somewhere in Germany or Switzerland wants me, I'll 1,000% do that for sure. Awesome. Yeah. That's really cool to hear because we ask, we've asked a few guys in the OHL if they'd, if they'd want to play 
in Europe. So it's cool to have a perspective from someone who's in the NHL and a little bit of Europe. Who actually could play in Europe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've been playing for 11, professionally for 11 years. So it's like, you know, if, if 13, 14 rolls around and I'm kind of sick of the grind over here and, you know, some team in Germany wants to throw some money at me, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to say no. And you get to travel the world. A lot of those leagues, you're in your bed every night. They're just like short trips because the countries are so small and, yeah. Um, they give you like two or three national team breaks. So you get like two weeks off two or three times a year, which helps with the grind. And um, so, team, you know, families are going to Italy for, for a week and your kids get to see the world. So, um, yeah, sign me up if somebody wants me. Yeah, sure. yeah. yeah. Options open. That's awesome. I think a lot of guys like you talk to the OHL guys, like I think it's more of a pride thing. Like they all think, oh, no, like I'm fucking sick. I'm going to play in the show type thing. Yeah. They'll, like they'll they'll realize – you know, the NHL only, I mean, I don't know if you guys know this stat, but I think in the history of the NHL since like 1910 till 2020, only eight, like 8,300 people have ever played at least one game. Oh, wow. Um, like if you think about that. Yeah. That's I mean, for, for the longest time, there was only six teams. But if you think about that, like you could put that, that's fucking half of Paris that's it yeah Jeez. you know and so like a lot of these kids I, hey have the dream have the confidence that you're going to do it but it's fucking hard man like it's not you're not going to just put a put a pic on Instagram that you got drafted like you're the work starts like every single day and yeah. I think a lot of these kids just want like kind of the the internet uh fame of yeah you know, of putting on it but the, you know they got to work for it so they, and that's that's all that's literally all it comes down to is who wants it the most every single guy for one guy in the nhl there's probably a hundred trying to take your spot and a uh, hundred guys that want it just as badly as you so like what do you want to do what are you going to do to stand out you know what i mean yeah. what's going to separate you from the pack so and it's not i'm not saying that to discourage anybody it's just hey it's, it's fucking hard work not everybody gets to do it yeah so it's the mature way to can. always think of you know there's always options that are that could still benefit you other than, you know, going to the big league, like, right. Sure Europe, right. Like, but a lot of these, yeah. A lot of these kids in the O I find nowadays, it's like just cool to just play in the NHL, which is yeah. sweet. Like, look, don't get me wrong, man. The NHL is unbelievable, but it's not everybody gets to do it. Yeah. And, uh, it's a fucking grind to get there. So you better, you better have your work boots on. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And I say that with all sense, all sincerity, like how it's just how bad you want it. You know, and you get a luck, you get lucky breaks here, here and there. But you know, I feel like you create your own luck with how hard you work. You know, For sure. yeah, I, I definitely think that's the perfect way to end it. Like on that note, and just a message for all of the, the young listeners we have, and even for me, like I, I'm taking everything in we got to learn today. And thank you so much for coming on. Obviously, our first professional athlete. That was so cool. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks again. Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me. Hopefully, I didn't ruin it for the next guy. <laughs> <laughs>